Hi, everybody. I'm going to um, give everyone a few more minutes to get on, and we are going to begin. Okay, um, it is nine o'clock and I'm gonna go ahead and start this session. This is the first class of a three-part series on um, Spark Learning. Um, this three classes are gonna focus primarily on um, uh, methods of sparking student curiosity in the classroom um, through a lens of an inquiry learning cycle um, and hopefully we'll have lots of conversations about how this applies to the current distance learning climate. Climate. So, uh, you know, I'm here in my uh, in my bedroom right now, where I have uh, facilitated distance learning for the past uh, ten weeks. Um, my four children are in the home right now, so if you see a little miniature child run behind me, um, that's just is a further sign that I'm in this with you all right now. Um, I want to give everyone a heads up that this first class is going to be uh, sort of part storytelling and then part um, specifics related to pedagogy and research. So it might feel uh, initially um, more like a keynote presentation while I lay sort of a, found, a foundation for some of the things that um, I'm hoping to explore um, with you all. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my keynote presentation and do that right now. And I'm going to begin. I have another device open right now where I can view the, uh, the chat. Um, and there's going to be a few moments back and forth for interaction, and I'll prompt everybody for that. Um, I do want to give everyone a heads up that at the end of each session, I'll push out a document um, so you can have all the slides and I will also paste that link into the chat as well. So everybody has that. Um, and it looks like there's uh, not too many of us with us this morning, so feel free to unmute yourself and interrupt me at any time. Um, just a reminder, if you're not muted right now, if you could go ahead and mute yourself. Um, it's just going to help everybody on um, on all the ends um, interact with the presentation because um, there is quite a bit of video in my presentation. So I'm hearing some static out there, so it's important just to make sure that you have muted yourself. All right, so uh, my name, like I said, is Ramsey Musalam. You know, really quick, I, it, I want to make sure that everybody's muted. So let's go through and look. If everyone could look at their mic and just make sure that they're muted. I'm hearing some static. Not sure where that's coming from. And it looks like everybody, everybody is. So I do apologize about that. Um, Okay, so my, my personal website is cyclesoflearning.com. Everything that I'm talking about in this presentation, resources to the materials that I'm going to reference, um, 
and uh, a book and TED Talk that I've delivered over the past few years are all accessible there. Um, most of the information that I'll be talking about um, can be found in this book. And um, what this book really tries to do is unpackage some of the tenants that I talk about in the talk that you can find on the website. Um, so uh, again, I'm gonna push out all of these slides to you. Um, so don't worry about um, not write, writing down everything that I'll be discussing. So this class, this first class is called the call to adventure. Um, and really, what do I mean by that? Well, the goal for the next 30 minutes is for me to tell a story about um, how I personally came to some realizations as a teacher. Um, and then why I'm calling this first class the call to adventure, I think will um, will become evident. So um, the first thing I like to do right now is just to pose a question to everybody out there and you can answer in the chat or you can go ahead and unmute yourself. And that is this question. Um, I would like you to share an instructional strategy that consistently sparks your students' interest in learning. So we all have some go-to techniques that we use. And I want you to reflect for a moment on your go-to techniques. Those things that you know just tend to always allow your students to forget that they're required by law to be there. And that's the way I like to think about it. That moment of flow when they're in it with you. So if you could go ahead and, re and uh, just reflect on this question for a moment. And when you're ready, go ahead and unmute yourself and share. Um, and if you're not comfortable doing that, you can just type it into the chat. And I'm gonna give everybody a few minutes to reflect on this um, and to answer. So I hear someone saying, um, provide a, a, a controversial question, turn and tell a partner about it. Um, Jennifer says, uh, peer learning using a current event. Uh, another participant, um, Abrils, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, so I do not want to do that incorrectly. Um, present students with some kind of phenomena, i.e. experiment. I have one, it's not necessarily a strategy, but um, well, there's two things. First of all, a, a really good visual that they just need to look at and wonder about, but also, and I don't know how I'm gonna do this online, but I'm working on it. I really changed the room up a lot. So when we study the Maya, we actually, I, they come in one day and suddenly there's an actual little rainforest in the room with about 40 plants and things. So a lot of work for you. But so much fun though. And it's like it's a huge unit every year and it's it it just makes the classroom not seem like a classroom and more a learning environment and that we're like transported to that place somewhat. Yeah, and they walk I'm sure they walk in right away and immediately are hit with that. It's awesome. And you don't have to do any any instructional preparation for them. They're just there and they're with you right away. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, hold on to that because I think we're gonna, we're gonna be referencing that when we talk about some of the strategies. Um, and I encourage everyone to just look here in the chat. We got a lot of STEM challenges, um, uh, things related to physics, a lot of themes showing up. And uh, one of the reasons, this is kind of meta, uh, I think you're really going to enjoy when we start deconstructing these ideas through the, the research, I think there's a lot of trends that we're seeing in people's strategies, you know, in terms of what are those things we can do with our students to get them to forget that they are required to be there by law. And it's kind of a, I don't know, controversial or a taboo thing to say, but in reality, I love that challenge. Just, you know, they walk in and suddenly their room is transformed into this Mayan culture or um, lots of great stuff there. So I'm going to uh, let you all peruse the chat um, and I'm going to move forward with this. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and what I'm going to do right now is move into a little bit of a reflection time 
where uh, I'm going to talk to you all about some of the things that shifted my perspective um, with respect to this. So what strategies work for me? Well, the truth is, you know, this is my 19th year in the classroom. And for the first half of my career, I really had no clue. Um, you know, I was your typical kid who, uh, you know, I, I think in 1999-2000, there were like two different kinds of chemistry teachers in uh, the Bay Area. There were uh, the people who, the kids who didn't get into medical school um, and, you know, had this knowledge base in science, or there were uh, the, the, the people that were in Silicon Valley after the dot-com boom exploded and didn't have anything else to do with their, with their uh, science knowledge and came into the classroom. I was the prior. I was a kid who you know, did not get into medical school and was kind of had this existential crisis and was wondering, what am I going to do with my life? Um, so I applied for a job at a Catholic school at the time because I didn't have a credential. And they were hiring teachers without credentials. And um, I entered the classroom. I really had no clue what I was doing. I found myself literally searching the internet for things like this. You know, what are the most effective teaching strategies? Um, you know, and I remember coming across a list um, of teaching strategies and I made this document. Um, this is a recreation of the document because at the time there were no, there was no Google Docs, but I remember putting it next to my desk and it would say things like clear lesson goals, show and tell, check for understanding, summarize new content, give them plenty of practice, teach strategies, not content, nurture metacognition. You know, I was 22. I had no idea what metacognition even meant. Um, and I was doing all these things and I had this little checklist and I was just trying desperately to figure out how to do this art form that we now know uh, is this thing called instructional pedagogy. And um, it, it was just this fascinating early time in my career. And I remember giving my student, this is later on, right? So I was just experimenting, experimenting and trying to figure it out. And really in many ways felt kind of like a fraud. Like I was this kid that was gonna go to medical school um, and now I'm teaching and I, uh, they're calling me Mr. Musalam, and I, I just, it, it felt really awkward. Um, and I remember giving my AP Chemistry students uh, this, this is the exact Google form, actually. Um, and this is like eight or nine years in to my career. Um, and my students really, really liked me. They wanted to be in my class. Um, but I had this hunch that it wasn't for the right reasons. Um, and I remember giving this, this form, and I just said, please provide me with your honest feedback about AP Chemistry this year. And this is a true story. If you notice, when you look at this form, there is no name. I forgot to ask them their name. So I literally gave them this ability to give me this anonymous feedback right away. Um, and it was, it was just hilarious. And I have some of the feedback right here. So, uh, and you can see this is on May 10th, 2010. I loved watching it blow stuff up, but I still have no idea what stoichiometry is. So I love that one. Even though I'm not planning on studying science at all in college, your class was the only one I looked forward to this year. So, okay, sort of a compliment, I guess. Um, it seemed to be perfectly honest that you were, it seemed to be perfectly honest that you were experimenting on us. I hate it when the problem looks different on a test. Stop trying to be all creative and stuff. So that was hilarious. Um, and this one, this one was the most telling. Not sure what this stuff means, but I got an A, so I guess I do. I consider you a friend. So this one, this person uh, had the ability to, to destroy my ability to motivate students to learn and also instill conceptual understanding and also called out my grade inflation all in one Google form response. So uh, this one was the one that really stuck with me, right? So I was I was struggling with this and, you know, now I'm uh, seven or eight years into my career and like all people who are feeling like an imposter, I love this quote, your fear, your fear of being publicly exposed as a fraud is a stress related disorder called the imposter syndrome. It's common among people in high profile authority positions and of course in actual phonies like you. I very much felt this way um, and like a lot of teachers or people in any careers who are feeling this imposter complex seeping in, feeling like there's this dissonance between what your students are experiencing and what you're doing in the classroom. I went and got a 
more degrees. Um, I went and got my credential, I got my master's degree, and I went and got my PhD. Um, and at the time that I was doing my research, uh, the educational technology thing was exploding, right? Um, this is around 2006, 2007. There were smart boards being delivered to people's classrooms. The internet was starting to get strong enough to do things like collaborative uh, Google Docs and, and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, and I ended up sort of falling in love with this idea of flipping my classroom, this idea that I could record a video of my students working. I could give them that for homework and then they could come to school and we can work on all this exciting um, information in the classroom. Um, and at the time, I was really struggling with this idea of homework, right? What is homework? Um, if I didn't give any homework, my students loved my class, but they were demotivated. If I gave too much, they hated it. Um, how would I grade it all? Would my class become just a homework review class? So there was all these things that I was struggling with, and I thought that this was really going to be the panacea, um, the silver bullet that was going to change everything for me. I ended up doing some of the first initial research on the flipped classroom. Um, and this was the title of my dissertation, um, the effects of using screencasting as a uh, pre-training tool to manage student cognitive load. So pre-training meaning giving students the video before they'd come to class. Cognitive load meaning if they watched it before they came to class, everything would feel a lot easier. Um, and I started to uh, get a lot of notoriety for this, right? I had a, an article in um, Edutopia. I uh, had an article on PBS about this. I mean, this is really early on. Um, in the classroom, I actually was invited to do a TED Talk that I referenced earlier. Um, you know, people like Sir Ken Robinson and John Legend and Bill Gates, and then me, total phony on stage. Um, so, but still, I had this sense that my students still weren't weren't feeling motivated or their 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 interest in learning wasn't sparked. I actually felt like students were saying things like, "Do we have to watch another video?" And then I would say things like, I, "But I worked really hard on making that video for you. It's really easy to watch. It's it's short. Um, you don't have to now see lecture in class." Um, and I still got a sense from them that they were very exhausted, that they didn't think it was cool anymore that they could rewind me over and over again. They just sort of felt like it was the same boring content, but just in a different location. So what I ended up doing was I went to the theoretical rationale of that paper I referenced earlier. Um, and the theoretical rationale for the flipped classroom um, and really, I'm not trying to diss the flipped classroom. I'm more talking about my journey um, to getting to where I am today. Um, the theoretical rationale for a lot of the work on um, the flipped classroom is John Sweller's cognitive load theory. So, you know, this is the idea that giving students a video like the one you see playing in front of you right here. Um, if I don't show them all the content right away, if I use different colors, if I direct their attention, if they're able to rewind the video, all the things we talk about when making instructional videos, that that's gonna really help students manage the information that they're taking in, as opposed to sitting in a classroom with all their peers as I present it. They can play me over again, they can view things um, in sequence, they can segment the information, just as you're seeing on the screen right now. So I would take so much time to make these videos. Like here I'm making a video on, on chemical equilibrium for my students, a really difficult concept, one that I struggle in teaching. So my, my, my knowledge was, my thought process was, if I could just give students these really curated, great videos to watch for homework, and when they came into class, we could do all the labs, I would have so much more time with them to motivate them around actually doing science, right? Um, and this is really sort of where I put a lot of my attention and my research and my career. It became a huge um, center point of my career. Um, so it, when we went back to investigate this, I stumbled across this video that Sweller made um, where he talks about cognitive load theory. And I had this huge aha moment 
And I was going through this kind of crisis. I was at 10 or 11 years into my career at this at this point. I'd spent $60,000 on a, a PhD doing research on something that I thought would revolutionize my career and my perspective perception of of my vocation but in reality i felt like my students were just as demotivated as they were in that first year when i was googling you know random techniques to use with them in the classroom um and we stumbled across this video by sweller and he says something in the video that was really an aha moment for me with respect to motivating high school students while using technology to teach. Um, and I'm going to play you a clip from this video. Just make sure on your end that your sound is, is up. Uh, 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 cognitive load theory works on the assumption that the students are fully engaged, fully motivated, that the attention is being directed. Uh, Cognitive load theory has nothing to say about a student who's staring out the window and not listening. <laughs> it's, uh, but of course, uh, that is frequent in our... In it, our it, it is frequent. And, and when I say cognitive load theory has nothing to say about it, I'm not saying it's unimportant. Yeah, it's just it, not part of the theory. It's just not part of the theory. Uh, 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 there are many ways of ensuring that, that students are motivated uh, and that they're cognitive resources are being fully devoted to the task. Once they're fully, once those cognitive resources are fully devoted to the task, cognitive load theory then says, okay, well, this is how you ought to organize the task. The issue of how do you get students to be fully directed, fully uh, concerned with the task and not concerned about the last night's party, that's for other theories. Uh, which doesn't mean it's unimportant. It's it's critically important. God, I love that. So he basically was saying, listen, cognitive load theory is fine, right? Um, all all the stuff that you're doing to make these videos solid is fine, um, but it's assuming that all of them have this control variable of equal motivation, right? And we know that that's not the case. I mean, he straight up said that's for other theories. How we get students motivated to the task, that's that's not what cognitive load theory is, is associating itself with. It's saying, hey, we have all these kids and they want to watch the video. So when you give them the video that's been modified and done really well, great. They're going to learn a lot from it. And it started to hit me. Oh, my gosh. In my literature review, all of the research was from two places. One college classrooms where students have chosen to be there, or two, from lab scenarios where students were brought in, given a video to watch and ask a set of questions. A lot of, none of the, I mean, a lot, there's a lot out there now, but none of my research came from this authentic classroom full of 14 year old kids, some who wanted to be there and some who didn't want to be there. And it just blew me away. Sweller didn't even argue. He said, listen, we're not concerned with motivation. We're not concerned with curiosity. We're concerned with structuring a learning experience, um, assuming equal motivation. Um, that's for other theories. So it got me thinking, like, what are these other theories? That maybe that's my problem. That maybe I'm putting all my attention into something that's assuming a control variable of motivation. And it was this, this moment for me that was that was, it really was kind of this like light bulb experience in my life. Um, and I remember when I had that, I was driving at the time I was teaching in San Francisco um, uh, at Sacred Heart Cathedral High School in downtown San Francisco. And I was living in Petaluma, which is where I live now. And it was about an hour drive with traffic. Um, and I was just reflecting on this one time. And I was doing uh, what I normally would do, just listen to a, a myriad of different uh, podcasts and radio episodes. And at the time, I was listening to Fresh Air on NPR. Um, and Terry Gross at the time was interviewing Jon Stewart uh, from The Daily Show. And uh, I always admired Jon Stewart for a couple of reasons. Um, regardless about how you feel about him politically, I always felt this interesting thing where 
he seemed really relaxed on stage and he seemed like he really knew what he was talking about, but he also seemed like he was creative and kind of talking from the hip and really just engaging the audience regardless. Like I always felt engaged, um, but I always felt like there was something else happening in the background that allowed me to feel that way. Um, so I'm gonna play you a clip from that interview. Yeah, tell us a little bit about what the morning meeting is like. Uh, the morning meeting is, uh, as we call it, our uh, morning cup of sadness. We get in uh, <laughs> around, uh, it, you'd be incredibly surprised at how regimented our day is and, and just how the, the infrastructure of the show is very much mechanized. It, you know, we come in and, and it's not, people always think, the daily show, you guys probably just sit around and make jokes. And uh, we've instituted to be able to sort of wean through all this material and synthesize it and try and come up with things to do. We have a very kind of strict day that we have to adhere to and by doing that that allows us to process everything and gives us the freedom to sort of improvise i'm a real believer in that creativity comes from limits not freedom freedom i think you don't know what to do with yourself but when you have a structure then you can improvise off it and feel confident enough to kind of come back to that so i love this idea of creativity coming comes from limits that this this there's this paradox that uh, super like a structured and intentionally structured experience actually opens up room for creativity. And he goes on to say to Terry Gross, it's through intense structure that I find the safety to be creative. And I just remember that hitting me like it, it, there was nothing wrong with what I was doing, but the structure that I had created for my classroom did not give me or my students room to be creative or to even think deeply about questions. It was very structured though. I mean, they had a video, they had a Google form they had to fill out. We came into the classroom, we did a lab. After that lab, I did a ton of other labs and activities. They would rewatch the lecture, we'd talk about it. But I had this mechanized thing and it was a great structure, but it didn't leave a lot of room. So what, what is that new structure? And essentially, I'm really asking myself, what is that other theory? that Sweller was referring to. Um, and this got me really thinking about, and at the time it was just, it was just like time where all this creative energy was happening. Like I started blogging um, and I just started thinking about just what does it feel like to be engaged in general? Like asking myself that question. And I remember watching this, uh, this TED talk, uh, at the time, I was really obsessed with the show Lost. And I remember just my wife and I would just sit there and wait for every episode. And I remember thinking to myself, like, what if my classroom was like this? Like, what if my students sat there and waited for every episode and they thought of my classes as episodes? Um, and I love what the creator of Lost, J.J. Abrams here, says about engagement in general. And this is when I really started to rethink the way I was going to teach. What are stories but mystery boxes? There's a fundamental question in TV. The first act is called the teaser. It's literally the teaser. It's the big question. So you're drawn into it. Then, of course, there's another question, and it goes on and on and on. I mean, look at, like, Star Wars. You've got the droids. They meet the mysterious woman. Who's that? We don't know. Mystery box, you know? Then you meet Luke Skywalker. He gets the droid. You see the holographic image. You learn, oh, it's a message. You know, she wants to, you know, find Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's her only hope. But who the hell is Obi-Wan Kenobi? Mystery box. So then you go, and he meets Ben Kenobi. Ben Kenobi is Obi-Wan Kenobi. Holy shit, you know? So it keeps us. <laughs> Have you guys not seen that? It's huge. Anyway, uh, so so there's this thing with uh, with with mystery boxes that I, I started feeling like compelled. Then there's a the thing of like mystery in terms of, of imagination, the in, 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 uh, the withholding of information. You know, um, doing that intentionally is much more uh, engaging. Whether it's like the shark in Jaws, if Spielberg's you know, mechanical shark bruise had worked. It would not have been remotely as scary. You would have seen it too much. In Alien, they never really show the alien terrifying. Um, even in a movie like, uh, you know, like a romantic, romantic comedy, The Graduate, they're having that date, remember, and they're in the car, and, and, and it's loud, and so they put the top up, and they're in there. You don't hear anything they're saying. You, you can't hear a word, but it's the most romantic date ever, and you love it because you don't hear it. So to me, there's that. I love that idea. You know, you love it because you don't hear it. And I had been spending so much time focusing on how my students heard things and how they saw things, you know, making all these instructional videos and going, oh, they need to hear this and they need to see this. And, and 
uh, they're going to come into class and we're going to reflect on this. And so much of it was about how they heard things, how they took in information. But what Abrams is saying is that you love it, meaning you're motivated by it because you don't hear it. You know, and it made me, this is kind of a cheesy little, uh, three cheesy examples here. But if you think about um, movies the, that he was referencing, and then you think about the teachers in those movies, right? The, the people who would represent us here online in the summer. Uh, you have Yoda um, here in Empire Strikes Back working with Luke, uh, arguably one of the most famous teachers of all times. Uh, you know, my kids right now are obsessed with Karate Kid. You have Mr. Miyagi working with Daniel, arguably one of the most famous teachers of all time in the movies. Um, you know, this, this scene where he's just basically tossing at him all this lower Bloom's taxonomy and, uh, you know, Daniel's not buying it, but he's sticking with it. So what is it about Mr. Miyagi that allows for him to be able to push Daniel through all this you know, lower blooms tasks, uh, waxing on, waxing off. Um, and then you have more intense teachers in great movies. Like here you have Sean, counselor in Goodwill Hunting, um, working with Will, um, you know, getting him to trust in him and access aspects of Will's personality or his past that he hasn't been able to reference before. Um, you know, three different teachers, Yoda, uh, Miyagi, and Sean. Um, and what is it about all of them that are allowing these connections to be made? Um, I could ask the question, and I I, I'm going to challenge you to type this into the chat. Uh, what do you think these three teachers have in common? Um, even if you haven't seen these movies, um, what do you think these three teachers have in common and i'm going to give everybody one minute to type into the chat right now you don't have to unmute yourself and i'm going to monitor it over here um and i just i'm just curious as to what you think so jennifer says confidence bravery and vision They speak with their eyes from Javier. Ooh, I love their students at the time did not know what they were doing. Engaging aura of mystery. They didn't give answers. They asked questions and gave tasks. Withholding information. Dabney says they have students do the work. They don't explain everything at the start, but allowing the experience to unfold through experience. Um, and these are all, I mean, I think everybody, if you've seen me uh, talk or we've met before, you know that I always love using this example. Um, Michelle says, providing students with the agency to be in charge of their own learning without realizing it. Um, and yes, I think everybody, everyone's nailing part of it. Um, I'm a science teacher, so I like to get really quantitative about it. So rather than from rather than talking about them and their behavior um, as teachers in the movie, I want to talk more about it through the lens of J.J. Abrams, right? Um, meaning from a lens of somebody who actually wrote this script. And I want you for a moment to think of the script as the lesson plan. Right. So writing Karate Kid, writing Empire Strikes Back, writing Good Will Hunting, as Gus Van Zandt did, what or actually in this case, that was Ben Affleck and, and Matt Damon. What is the the script is the lesson plan. OK, so. And when they're writing it, when does the teacher appear? OK, so Empire Strikes Back, Yoda appears 47 minutes into the movie. Okay, the Miyagi in this famous disturbing scene, you know, Daniel's getting beat up by Johnny um, and all the other Cobra Kai guys. And right before Daniel gets beat up, Miyagi hops over the fence and saves him at 40 minutes and 56 seconds. But he lets him get beat up. He gets punched in the stomach really bad first. 
And then Sean here, seen at Bunker Hill Community College, this famous scene in Goodwill Hunting, he appears at 41 minutes into the movie. So all these teachers appear somewhere in this 40 minute range. Now I'm not saying 40 minutes is the rule, but I, I love this time because it's it's a significant amount of time into the movie where you meet the mentors or the teachers, right? And this makes sense actually, and this is getting into the title of today's class, makes sense. You know, if you look at Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, the helper or the mentor, it's not the first person that you interact with, right? It's you didn't turn on Star Wars and see me and see Yoda right away or Ben Kenobi. You don't open up Karate Kid and see Miyagi going, okay, it's time to paint this car, Daniel, right? That didn't happen. There was this appearance of the teacher, of the mentor. And I want you to think of yourselves right now as that person. Um, it's occurring later. And I challenge you to go read any book or watch any movie that you would call engaging. And I want you to keep track of where the teacher appears. Okay. Now for me in my old pedagogy, I was the first thing, but I was in a video. And I thought because I was in a video that it was okay because they could watch me at any time. But I was forgetting this tenant that it's not about where I am in a video or in the classroom, but about when, right? It's not about where, but more about when. Um, and, you know, if you if you pair this hero's journey cycle, this, this thing, this mythical thing that has engaged people forever before technology, and I'm sure after technology dies, this thing will last. And you put it next to modern educational jargon, um, like the 5e learning cycle, which is really a fabulous thing that I follow that is designed to engage students in science or any other subjects and help transform their learning and really help their learning become cognitively authentic. Um, you know, the hero's journey calls that first place the call to adventure. In the 5e learning cycle, we call that the moment of engagement, right? In the hero's journey, we have uh, this, this threshold challenge that the hero needs to overcome. Well, in educational ling lingo, we call that explore, right? We want our students to explore first, right? In the hero's journey, we have the mentor appearing. Well, in 5e learning cycle, we call that the moment of explanation. I was doing this first. Um, and even though I, I got a degree out of it and um, I got notoriety, it, I was doing the, what Joseph Campbell told us not to do. I was bringing the mentor into the experience first, right? Um, the hero's journey uh, says that the hero is not going to be transformed, right? Well, we ask our students to elaborate. The hero then returns home to be judged and we evaluate our students. So I do think that it, it, there's no secret that this pedagogy that is designed to engage and teach and transform our students actually mirrors the hero's journey, right? And this to me was this big realization, this big moment. Um, when you download these slides, I love this graphic that sort of puts them together at the same time. Um, so it, really, if the research on curiosity, right? So this, this desire to know something really relates to this, right? Because we want the hero to be curious. Um, now, um, in whatever movie we're talking about, right, the hero is called to adventure. The hero is called to their curiosity out of something that happens in the world. Well, my students walking into my classroom at 8 a.m. every day or getting on their computer on Zoom coming up isn't necessarily the same thing as needing to come home from the Trojan War, right? So how can we for a lack of a better word, excuse me, manipulate them into feeling this tension between what they know and what they don't know. And if we can do that, um, then we really can create heroes' journeys out of our lesson plans. So the research on curiosity really is interesting. Um, if you put curiosity on the x-axis, this desire to know something, and knowledge 
or I'm sorry, on the Y, and knowledge on the X, we get this interesting inverted U shape, right? And this is direct measurements using um, functional magnetic resonance imaging. So we get this inverted U where if you have all the knowledge, right? I gave them all the knowledge in a video before they came to class. They're not that curious about it because they already have it. If they don't have any information, they're also not that curious about it. But there's this sweet spot right in the middle where you have withheld the intentional perfect amount of information, right? The mystery box. You know a little bit, but you've intentionally withheld a purposeful amount. And that leads to this max curiosity. I love thinking about it this way. Right, we can, I can ask you questions like, uh, you know, and as I ask these, try to answer them in your head. You know, what galaxy is the Earth part of? And I bet a lot of people in your head will be like, oh, the Milky Way. Or what is Barack Obama's middle name? A lot of people might be, okay, I don't know. Hussein might be. Um, what instrument sounds like a human singing? Right. So you might be thinking some things in your head right now. Um, and then I'll tell you it's actually the violin. Um, what is Newton's third law? Some people might recall some past knowledge and you might think action reaction. Um, and then the, the question, can you embed a video inside a Google document? Um, I know this is the Microsoft session, but I'm, I assume there's some Google users as well. Um, and you're thinking about this in your head right now, right? Um, and the answer is, Yes and no. You can if it's YouTube on a Google Slides, but you can't in a Google document. So these were actually questions from the research studies here, and these were the two high curiosity items. Um, everybody knows what an instrument is. Everybody's heard people sing, but they don't necessarily know that it's a violin that was invented to sound like a human being singing. Like that was the core root of that invention of that instrument. Um, and can you embed, embed a video in a Google document? Well, we've heard the word embed. We might know what a Google document it is, but, um, but we're not really quite sure. Can we embed? Can we put a video in a Google document? Um, and I, I, I show you these examples because what's really interesting is if you flop the axis here and you put curiosity actually on the uh, on the x-axis and you put this thing called mental muscle on the y and they define mental muscle as the ability to negotiate complexity so let me rephrase it to you in the way i think about it exactly what we want our students to be able to do right like the only thing i want my students to be able to do in the world other than be kind and interact well with other human beings is to be able to negotiate complexity confidently like, I want them to have mental muscle. I want them to be able to understand how to get through a complex scenario to better their lives. That, to me, is the mission of what we do as teachers, right? And what they found out was that there was this direct relationship. So the more curious people are, the more their ability to negotiate mental muscle is. So at that moment, before I told you that it was a violin, right, I could have actually given you a task, uh, any task, maybe a math task or a riddle, per se, and you would have been able to negotiate that riddle better than if I gave you that riddle after I asked you one of the low curiosity items. And it was subtle, but enough to be statistically significant. And the implication is huge. By withholding the right amount of information, we are basically preparing our students' minds to be ready to take in information, right? We are calling their minds to adventure. And the, the call comes from this. The mind hates that dissonance. We all know what it feels like to have a tip of the tongue feeling. It drives us crazy, right? The mind wants that resolve. So how can we do that in our classroom and in our lessons? Um, you know, curiosity prepares the brain for better learning. And it's this, it's this paradox. I mean, I was giving my students all the information in the video, but I wasn't preparing their minds for better learning. I was thinking that if I got the information out of the way, I wouldn't have to do it in the classroom, 
rather than thinking of the journey itself as driving them towards wanting the information, right? So it's a very different shift, driving them towards wanting that information. Um, I love what Nate Cornell out of Williams College, he's a hero of mine. He, he does a lot of work on this ability to negotiate complexity. And he says, difficulty builds mental muscle while ease builds only confidence. And I love, I love that quote. Um, so I want to I want to share with you an example of a time. Let me shut my window here. Share with you an example of a time uh, recently in the classroom when I really screwed this up, and I think it really provides uh, a nice introduction into the challenge that I'm going to leave you all with uh, before our next class. All right, so what I was doing, well, and I want to apologize that this feels a little, like I said, very uh, less interactive, but um, I really wanted to lay a, a foundation here. Um, all right, so I was I was teaching a lesson on acids and bases in my AP chemistry class, uh, and this is a this is something that whether you are an elementary school teacher or a humanities teacher or math teacher, um, you probably all can relate to there being something that is really difficult to get students interested in learning, right? Something that you really and this is a this is a topic that I really struggle in getting students interested in learning for two reasons. One, it's a hard thing for them to understand, mainly because they walk into the world with all these preconceptions about acids. Like the word acid alone bring, brings up all these sort of like scary things like acid burns and battery acid and all this stuff. So they already have this whole mixed idea of what an acid is. And then teaching them the math behind it is tricky too, because uh, some acids are strong and some acids are weak. Um, and uh, those both involve different calculations. So there's, it, it, it's just a complex domain. Um, but because it's so pertinent to their lives, it's a very important concept. Um, it's why our food gets digested in our stomachs. So um, it's something that I, that's challenging to teach them. So this concept of pH or acidity is really challenging. Um, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to get them really interested in learning it. I remember my, my wife saying, well, OK, you do this thing. And this is, by the way, when I'm teaching this, I've already shifted my whole pedagogy to embrace this hero's journey approach to teaching. So, you know, my wife says there's that great scene in the movie Fight Club where, uh, you know, the, the main character, Edward Norton, um, gets a chemical burn on his hand um, and then Brad Pitt neutralizes that burn. Um, and she's like, you know, it's not really applicable to life, but I, I do think that you could show that to students and do your whole thing where you withhold some information and get them curious about it. And I got to thinking and I said, OK, that is true. This is actually an acid based reaction. <coughs> and um, maybe what I could do is I could find that video clip, I could steal it and I can modify it to get students curious about what the reaction was. And that could lead into the whole hero's journey like this would be the call to adventure. Um, and I got really excited about it. So I found the video online. I just Googled Fight Club Chemical Burn. I stole it from the internet. Um, and then I, I threw it in ScreenFlow, which is the way that I like to edit videos. And um, and if you've never seen this movie, uh, I do want to give everyone a heads up that the clip I'm about to show you might be, uh, you know, it's it, it's not too graphic, but you know, if, you, if you're squeamish, you might not want to watch it. Um, so I took the video and I put it in ScreenFlow and I started to do some editing. Um, when the uh, the chemical was poured, I, I, I had a caption come up that said, here's the chemical. And when it was neutralized, I had another caption come up that said, here's the chemical reaction that just happened and all this stuff. And I, and I was really proud of myself. And this was actually a sub assignment. So I was going to have students watch it um on their computers when i was absent that day um and i was going to ask them this a question you know how does this relate to what you think we're about to learn um and here is the first video what is this this is chemical <laughs> all right so i had the uh, the first scene and i had that caption come in sodium hydroxide solid 
right? I had that come in right away. And I had this, this sub prompt them to write that down, right? So the white powder initially was sodium hydroxide, right? Then I showed them the second clip. Congratulations. Right, and that was the neutralization scene. And I wanted to keep the clip short because I didn't want to, uh, to scare the students too much. Um, and I had them write down that reaction. Okay, so acetic acid reacts to produce sodium acetate in water, and they're writing it all down, right? So um, I was feeling really proud of myself because I engaged them by using Fight Club, and I taught them an acid-base reaction that now they have in their notes. And, you know, we know that it, it's, for me, I hate giving sub-assignments, and I'm always really nervous about whether or not they're learning. So, um, and then I pushed out this Google form to them. And I said, how does this scene relate to what you've learned thus far about acid-base reactions? So um, here's what some students said, and this is the actual screenshot. Is that really Brad Pitt? Why is Brad Pitt mad at Edward Norton? Can we watch the entire movie? That's the classic one, right? Didn't you already show us in the video what happens? One word, hot, not what they're referring to there, probably Brad Pitt, but whatever. And, but this was the really telling one. Didn't you already show us in the video what happens? And it is true, I did. I forgot that tenant, that you love it because you don't hear it. So luckily I had another class the next day that hadn't seen it yet. And I modified the clip to withhold the information to see if I could drive them towards it. Because remember, I'm gonna teach them about acid and bases. That's gonna happen, right? My goal in this clip wasn't to teach them it. My goal was to call them to adventure, to get them curious about acids and bases, right? So pay close attention here to the modified version. What is this? This is chemical. <laughs> okay. And I just stopped it. I didn't bring in anything. I just stopped it. Okay, here's the second clip. Okay, and I just stopped it. And then I asked them the question again. And here were their responses. What's that white stuff? What's in the bottle? Is that an acid burn, Brad Pitt? and acid or base. So, so minus the Brad Pitt question, all of the questions were exactly what I wanted them to ask. What's the white stuff? Now I can tell them what the white stuff is. What's in the bottle? Now I can tell them, is that an acid burn? Actually, no, it's a base burn. So it gives me a chance to get the misconception around acid and the base is clear. So by withholding the information, the students asked me for the information. Again, by withholding the information, the students asked me for the information. And in asking me for it, they're now priming their brains for me to tell them. It, it's a subtle difference. Can we trick our students into asking us for the content? Um, the late writer David Foster Wallace says this really well. He said, great writers, comedians, and magicians have a lot in common. All depend on a certain quantity of vital information removed, but evoked by a communication in such a way as to cause an explosion of associative connections within the recipient, right? That is what we want to do with our students. That's at least what I want to do. When I retire, I wanted to say, Ramsey Musalam created an explosion of associative connections amongst his students. That I want that to be what, what my legacy as a teacher is that I help students realize the way the world works. And I challenge you to think about that for your own practice, right? So the, the thing which I'm gonna leave you with now is a challenge and some examples here. Um, okay, that's fine. We wanna withhold enough information to get our students in this middle zone, right? But how do we do that? How do we call them to adventure? What is some strategy around that? Okay, and I really want you to pay close attention to this part here, because as we conclude, this is really going to be what um, what I'm going to have you all focus on between now and the next class. 
So the research calls this involuntary curiosity, right? The unintentional exposure to a curiosity-inducing stimuli. Uh, in, in, in layman's terms, this means taking people who aren't curious about what you're talking about and making them curious, right? And that's, to me, that is the most tangible way for me to think about my students, right? So it talks about three strategies that I don't think are going to be uh, any uh, surprise to you. And by the way, this was the question I asked you, and many of you said this early on, right? The first thing is to actually give them a scenario where information is withheld. So just remove some information from the situation. The other strategy is to get them to anticipate what's going to happen next. So give them a scenario and stop it before it's over, right? And the last one is to just show them something that completely violates their expectations, right? And this is the Mayan classroom that we heard of early on, right? You walk in and you're like, whoa, I know this is the Mayans, but this is blowing me away right now. I did not expect this. This is violating my expectations. And I want that to actually, that's gonna motivate the brain to wanna know more. Why is it there? What are we gonna learn? Right, so there's these three things, these tools we have now. <clears throat> if we wanna call our students to adventure, we can remove information, we can get students to anticipate more information, or we can violate their expectations. And I wanna show you some examples here right now. Um, on the screen here, you're looking at two different word clouds, right? So if I'm teaching like a government class, per se, I could, I could show students both of these word clouds. And I can ask them this general question, you know, what are you curious about? Even right now, when you're, when you're, when you're looking at this right now, what are, you, what are you curious about, right? What, what are you thinking when you're looking at these? Um, the word cloud on the left and the word cloud on the right. Right. Um, and a lot of students will ask, will say things like, uh, you know, this first word cloud and this second word cloud, I think that these are from speeches. Right. And it turns out that they are from speeches. And this is a missing information spark. The first one on the left was from Obama's inauguration speech and the one on the right was from Trump's. Um, but in, a, in Obama's speech, if we looked at it closely, I left some words in there. Um, I left the word Romney in there and in Trump's I left the word president and fantastic uh, a word that he uses quite a bit and what I was trying to do there was I was trying to get uh, give you some of the information but not all of the information right and then the subsequent tasks after that could lead into questions around their view of America etc um, so that's an example of a missing information spark um, here we have one from a physics class if you just watch that video really carefully um, I once used this when I was teaching physics. I just had this playing over and over again as students walked into the classroom. Um, and I didn't have to say a word. They just gathered around the screen right there. But if you notice, I have edited this video. I don't have any sound playing. Um, I have it on repeat over and over. And uh, students would just get fixated on the bottom of that slinky. They couldn't believe that it was just hanging there in thin air, even though the top was dropped, right? So this is an example of a spark that violates students' expectations. What do they want? They want to know more about how that happens. And that's now going to lead us into the, the next phases of the hero's journey, which our other courses are going to be about. Um, Here is a data visualization. If you look at it really carefully, you see that there are a bunch of orange spots and you have a bunch of years. And I just showed this to students. Actually, this was done by our AP US history teacher at our school. Um, just showed it to students and asked them the question, what are you curious about? Um, eventually, students would say things like, you know, what does the orange represent? And then they'd have long discussions about what the orange represents. Eventually, one student will see that there's a lot of orange there between 1930 and 1939, um, with a lot of it there in 1934. Um, one student would say maybe it's weather, a teacher would say yes, and it leads to this discussion about eventually leading to the Dust Bowl. Um, even though students didn't know anything about the Dust Bowl yet, um, then the teacher would ask questions like, well, look at 2012 and 1934, what do those have in common? Leading to an awesome discussion about weather patterns, economics, government, etc., farming tools, leading in then 
to a lecture and discussion about the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, rather than doing it the other way around. And a great example of a missing information spark, that diagram had a legend on the bottom that said weather patterns um, during the Great Depression. Um, here's a, a one that I enjoy using from um, uh, Indiana Jones. <laughs> All right, so I stopped this early and I asked questions, you know, what mistake is Indiana making? And a lot of times students will realize right away that he is trying to steal a gold statue with a bag of sand. Well, the mistake he's making is he thinks that all things that have the same size have the same weight. Obviously, that bag of sand would need to be much bigger, um, leading to a lesson on density. And this is a great example of an anticipated solution. When I made that video, I stopped it early, getting the students thinking about what would happen next. Um, and that's going to lead to your first challenge, right? And I'm going to push these slides out to you in the chat. Um, your first challenge is going to be this, and there is a link to it right there. If you go to the address bit.ly slash class one challenge, um, what you're going to see is a form that I'm going to challenge you to fill out, right? Obviously optional, right? But I'd like to push this out to you so we have some things to share. And uh, the form looks like this, right? The first thing I'm going to do is ask your name. Um, feel free to, to not put your name in if you don't feel comfortable with that. Um, and then I'm going to ask you to identify a topic in your curriculum that is challenging for students and describe that topic below. So for me, it would have been acids and bases are really challenging for my students, right? And then what I'm going to challenge you to do is part two, which says create an image or video clip that sparks student curiosity about your chosen topic. In the space below, place a publicly accessible link to your Spark. So find a video, edit it down, or find an image, edit it down, with the goal of presenting it to students and for them to ask the questions that will then allow you to tell them the answers, right? Questions that are sort of riddling the content you have. OK, so I'm going to put a link to this in the chat for everybody. Um, and at that right now, it is 10 o'clock, exactly one hour. And um, before I put that document in the chat, I just want to find out if there's any uh, any questions that you have right now um, and go ahead and unmute yourself and I'll be happy to ask answer those. I know we moved a little bit fast. Um, but if you have any questions, go ahead and ask them at this point. Ramsey, Ramsey how do yeah. you get permission from the creators of the videos to do the edits? Otherwise, it's copyright infringement. No, yeah, great question. So what I'm what I'm usually doing is I'm getting the video on YouTube and that and I'm going to talk more about that in the next class. Um, so you can do one of two things. If I download the YouTube video and I edit it, right, I'm not reposting that online. So what I'm doing is I'm taking that video, I'm downloading, I'm editing it, and I'm presenting it a portion of that video to my students as they walk into class and saying, what are you curious about? I'm not reposting it online and sharing that out. So actually, that is completely fine for me to do that, right? I'm saving that locally on my computer. Um, the other thing that I've been doing a lot of is just finding something on YouTube and just lining that video up with the trimming it just manually to that exact point I want them to see and, and pulling out the sound if I need to pull out the sound. Um, and then another really simple trick that I can do is actually just put the video embedded into my presentation, whether it's PowerPoint or Keynote or Google Slides, and then uh, put in an animation in that to cover up the portion that I want to cover up. So what they're actually, what's actually happening is the native video is playing, but the animation in the slide is covering up the portion I want to cover up. But that's going to be something that we talk about. So when you guys find a spark, um, what I would do is just put the YouTube video in and indicate what portions of it you want to play normally. Hopefully that answers your question. Any other questions out there? 
Uh, you mentioned ScreenFlow for your yeah. editing. Can uh, are you going to maybe discuss that next time a little bit, or why that why that tool? Yeah. Okay. So I could. So do you use a Mac or a PC? A Mac. Okay. Great. So um, ScreenFlow. If you want to spend some money, it's not free. So if you want to spend some money on a uh, a piece of editing software, um, I really suggest ScreenFlow. So here's why I like it. Um, it it allows you to do two things. One is I can get a video like from YouTube, right? So I find the Fight Club video or the Indiana Jones video from YouTube. I download it using, a, there's a ton of free, totally legal tools to download videos from YouTube. So I download it. Now I have the MP4 and I want to edit it so that I can show it to my students and get them curious about it. So I can take that video and I can put it in ScreenFlow and the interface on ScreenFlow is very easy to use. There's just a scrubber at the bottom and I can add in animations, okay? So I use that as my video editing tool, but ScreenFlow is also a screencasting application. So I can record my own screen as well, okay? And that is like right now, I have ScreenFlow running in the background recording this whole thing we're doing right now, just so that I can go back and watch it and, and improve my own consulting practice. So. Unlike iMovie, which is just a video editing tool, ScreenFlow does both, right? Now, if you want free tools, there's things like Screencast-O-Matic and all kinds of things that are great online. But ScreenFlow um, and Camtasia is also one on the PC that people use. I really like it because it's a lot of bang for my buck. I have a high-end uh, video editing software and I have a high-end screencasting software going on there. And by the way, from a meta perspective, when I was showing that clip, I, I was hoping someone would ask this question. So I intentionally didn't stop and say what ScreenFlow was as a way of kind of modeling that idea of withholding the right information, kind of piquing people's interest about it. So that was a little bit of a, a meta example of the whole thing. Any other questions out there? Um, Ramsey, where yeah. do you normally get your ideas from, or is it just like uh, specific that's places? That's a good question. Um, what subject do you teach? Um, I teach science. Okay, I like great. chemistry, actually. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, there, there's a couple things. There's like the 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 uh, the answer that's not the, the not the comfortable answer, and then there is the 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 other answer. So the non-comfortable answer is once once I made the decision, like let's take let's say a, a balancing a chemical reaction. Okay, so um, when I was doing a lot of flipped classroom, the the lesson planning process was make a video that was grounded in cognitive load theory about balancing a chemical reaction, push it out to students check to see if they watched it using whatever form or management system I had. Come to class, do a lab that I knew, um, and then have them do a ton of practice on that, right? So a flow. Um, the thing about that was that didn't require any real creative energy on my end. That just required a, like work ethic for me to do that a lot. So now what I say is I'm gonna lecture to them on balancing reactions. What I want to do first is I want to get them to want to learn balancing reactions. So then I got to think about uh, examples of reactions out there or activities that I can do that can get them to sort of feel perplexed about this idea of balancing chemical reactions. So then that's where the creative piece goes. And this is the bad answer, which is, I just start scouring the internet for intriguing chemical reactions, or I might do something like just show them a reaction that's balanced and one that's not, even though they don't know how to do it yet, and say, one of these is wrong, one of these is right. Which one do you think it is and why? And they might start to make connections about what that process even is. So, um, but then I'll start looking at other people's work. Like I'll go to Dan Meyer's work in math and look at the way he does this process. He basically has a whole uh, outline process for doing this exact thing in math education. 
Um, or I might go to other websites that discuss phenomena. Um, you know, sometimes I might even go to the Flynn scientific videos where they talk about different labs. And I might say, oh, maybe I could just show the students this lab video, but pull away the sound. So they're, they see it happening, but they don't really know what's happening. Um, you know, uh, one that I did this year was I just gave them all a piece of steel wool um, and I and I just took a nine volt battery to it in front of them and I asked them, um, does the mask go up or down? And they had to think about it. Then I had them go do that. And that was the challenge. And they realized, whoa, the mask goes up even though they see it burning. It doesn't make sense. Why does it go up? And eventually that led into the reaction for the oxidation of iron. <clears throat> so it just requires a different way of thinking. What do you want them to learn? How can you get them asking? And then scouring the internet and scouring your own things. A lot of times, and this is a long answer, but I love talking about this stuff. A lot of times the answers are at your fingertips, right? You might have demos you've done in the past or videos you've done in the past or even labs you've done. And all you might need to do is just do it without telling them what you're doing or just do it and just pull away information and don't be afraid of perplexing them because that is the whole point of this. <coughs> you want to confuse the heck out of them so they say, tell me more about how it works. <coughs> um, if you go to my blog, cyclesoflearning.com and you just peruse the different posts, you're going to see a ton of examples though of like me musing about this idea. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions out there? Ram Ramsey, if um, I'm bargaining right now for my chapter and so I might miss some coming classes, are these going to be posted if we miss a class? Yeah, yeah. If you just go to the schedule for uh, this, this, whole, this whole program that Microsoft is offering and it'll just have everything recorded. And then my other question is, you know, I haven't been able to find really any good spaces where teachers are talking about teaching science remotely. Um, I read your blog in the spring, mm -hmm. but uh, do you know any spaces where science teachers are getting, I have like my Twitter chat and we're all struggling. So. I know. Oh God, it's really a mess right now, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, literally like what I was doing before you guys came on is I was, redoing my entire first two weeks as we were just told we have to go full distance for the first for the first quarter so like i i feel like everybody's in triage mode right now um to be honest with you so if you could just go to my website and shoot me an email with that question um and then i'm gonna i'll shoot you a link with all the all the resources that i've been collecting um, what one thing that I that I do know is that I have to teach a robotics class online. So I, <laughs> I found some two really great resources for doing that. One, one is a really cheap little programmable robot that I'm going to have my kids order and use at home. And then another is a um, is a simulation I found online. So I can share with you all those resources. Well, I have a UDL. I was doing a research project with the NSF, and now they've converted it to UDL. So I might just start my year with that, hoping we can go back if our numbers come down in my county. So Yeah, where are you located? I'm at Naval Air Station Lemoore, down in the Central Valley. Okay, cool. Yeah, we're in, so, in Sonoma County, so we're on yeah. the right now. So, so uh, All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, folks, here's what I'm going to do. It's 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 a little bit over right now. So out of respect to the next sessions and next presenters, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Um, but I will see you all next Wednesday, where our goal is to talk more about details around what happens next after we call them to adventure and hopefully share some of your sparks to begin class. Um, thank you all so much. I'll see everybody later.